if you're getting a gut reaction from someone or somebody says something that right away you're like, ooh, like, you know, that was harsh or I don't know about this person. I, you know, I just so encourage women out there because we're trained and taught and it's also our nature just to be giving and lovely to go ahead and be like, eh, that doesn't feel good to me. And you can be very graceful about how you say no. You can be kind, but please start saying no, <laughs> please, and start doing the stuff you want to do. Welcome back to the Essentially You podcast, all about reinventing your health with safer, cheaper, more effective natural solutions and powerful lifestyle changes so that you become the CEO of your health. I am your host, Dr. Marisa Snyder. Have you ever wanted to know how to implement self-care practices while living a hectic life? Because let's be honest, For many of us, life can move at a very fast pace and sometimes feel a bit hectic no matter how hard we try to operate from ease and grace. And that's why I am excited to introduce a sister from another mother and an amazing self-care rock star herself, Jennifer Iserlo. Now, Jennifer has figured out the secret sauce and she's going to be sharing how to make self-care work for each of us no matter what. Now, in a world where Instagram features the most perfect images of women rocking self-care with the perfect bath and morning ritual, Jennifer and I are going to get real and share why your personal self-care is a must and how you can leverage some simple tools to make it easy for you. But before we jump into this really fun and powerful interview, I want to take a moment, as I love to do, and celebrate your wins. Now, one particular health rock star is Samantha Woodward, and I'm excited to shout out her win that she shared on Facebook about seven to 10 days ago. So here is what she wrote. Dr. Marisa is the real deal on and off the podcast. I had a chance to catch her while she was on her book tour, and I loved her authentic nature. She shared a vulnerable story about her journey, and it was very similar to my own. And I can't tell you what that means to have someone who actually gets you. I have told all of my friends about this podcast, and since listening since last fall, I have made several changes that gave me my energy and my sanity back. Dr. Marisa, keep it up. Aw, Samantha, well, you are a girl after my own heart. Understanding our bodies and how to create amazing health is what it is all about. And if you are listening today, I would love to gift you my Superwoman blend. So all you have to do is either message me on Facebook or on Instagram. And on Facebook, it's Dr. Marisa Snyder. And on Instagram, it's at Dr. Marisa, which is D-R-M-A-R-I-Z-A. Now, fellow podcast listeners... I absolutely love shouting you out too, and I can't wait to share your message here on the podcast. Now, if you are down to share your message, you can easily reach out to me via Insta or Facebook or by simply reviewing this podcast, the Essential You podcast on iTunes or whatever podcast platform you love to plug into. That way, we change the world by giving women solutions at their fingertips and provide much needed information for women to take to their doctors or to take to whomever is working with them. In today's world, we really do got to be the CEO of our own health. All right, let's jump into this powerful and engaging interview with Jennifer. But first, I want to sing her praises. Jennifer Iserlo is a professionally trained chef, author, and emotional healer, and a leader in promoting healthy, vibrant lifestyles through healthy, delicious food paired with spiritual practices. A classically trained chef and graduate of the Institute of Culinary Education, Jennifer is also a certified yoga teacher, certified Reiki practitioner, and a graduate of the Institute of Integrative Nutrition. She is the best-selling author of 50 Shades of Kale, and The Healing Slow Cooker, among 22 other books. She's also a blog and article generating machine and has recipes for publications such as Self, Yoga Journal, Parents, Prevention, In Style People, First for Women, and on and on. You can go and check her out and check out her program, Just Eat Smarter. And the best place to find her right now is the superfoodalchemy.com slash book because we're going to be talking about her newest book, 
today in the interview. Let's welcome her on. Welcome to the Essentially You podcast, Jennifer Isolo. How are you doing today, girl? Oh, I'm so happy to be here. I'm doing well. Well, I am so happy to have you. We, you know, we had the last couple of minutes an opportunity to connect together. And oh my goodness, I already feel like we're soul sisters. And I love that you took some time. I know that you're in Ontario, Canada right now promoting and just letting people know about your book. I'm so excited. We're going to get to talk about that today as well. But most importantly, what I'm excited about is already what we've talked about. I feel like we should just go back and try to grab and record that. But that's how to balance your self-care practices with a hectic life because that's the real talk, right? That's the thing. I think so often when women think we're talking about self-care that I'm asking them to shift a life that they may not be able to shift, right? This hectic life. And I believe that self-care that allows us to continue to live the life that we need to live in case we can't make changes. There's a lot of women out there who cannot change the way their life is at the moment. And that's what we're going to be digging into. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I work with my health coaching practice with a lot of integrated and functional medicine practitioners. And these are folks who have to be entrepreneurs because they have cash-based businesses. So they're kind of forced into entrepreneurship. A lot of them are introverts like myself. So they do not love doing Facebook and Instagram and all these things, but they must do it. And, you know, they have a busy practice where they're helping to heal hundreds of people, sometimes thousands of people over, you know, the span of a few years. And many of them also have families and they're busy working moms and it can be extremely draining on them to take on the not only the physical role of a lot of these duties but the psychic role of it you know laying awake at night worrying about patients and their family and it can be a real drain and you know as somebody who's pretty much worked in all the different caregiver aspects you know I was in customer service before I became a chef then I became a chef and I, I worked for celebrities and I kind of felt like I was their grandma giving them love and great food. And then I worked as a health coach. So I know exactly where people are and what they're going through. But what's so important is that we take care of ourselves so that we have the energy to keep going, but also as a way just to balance our mindset so that we can get a little perspective on all the craziness in that, you know, sometimes we aren't going to be able to change our jobs or we aren't going to be able to check off everything on our to-do list. And, you know, I consider myself as an A-type personality. I want to do every single thing on the to-do list list. And it's just, you know, with regular meditation and self-care, sometimes it's okay to, to let go of a few things and put yourself first for 10 minutes a day. Let's talk a little bit about that because that's so much what self-care is for me. It's just giving myself permission to, to pause, to just take a moment And sometimes those moments can be all that we really need. You know, I am a self-proclaimed type A person. I don't know how to not be productive. And the thing is, is that I really love what I do just like you. You know, we just got back from Mexico. We were in Puerto Vallarta because I just got done with a big book launch. And that was a nine-month ordeal. I mean, we were working our tails off for nine. And that that was the marketing of the book. That wasn't the the two years it took me to write the book. You know, it was the, it was the marketing of the book and you with 23 books out there, you get what it takes to get these books out in there. And it's one thing to write a book it's another thing to market it. But so we decided to take a vacation to Puerto Vallarta for a week. My husband was, he's more, he's my balance in a lot of ways. That man has got some pretty good boundaries. He's the one who's like, it is vacation time. We've earned this. We've deserved this. You know, my book was the number one health book in the nation for several weeks. And so he was like, we, we've we earned it. It's finally time. So we're in Mexico. And girl, I, I worked about three to four hours every single day when I was in Mexico because I did not want to come home yesterday. <laughs> that's the entrepreneurial vacation where you're still working, but you're only doing two hours a day. So it feels like nothing. It feels like nothing. <laughs> I did not want to come home on Monday because we got home Sunday night. So yesterday was Monday. I didn't want to come home on Monday and feel if there there are two times that I feel very anxious. One, I'm an anxious flyer, which is such a bummer because I fly a lot. But then two, I'm an anxious comer home. Like coming home, I don't want a a big pile of stuff on my plate. I don't want to feel so crunched in on that Monday. And so let me guess, you never go to bed without doing the dishes. 
not do, I mean, there's a whole lot of things I don't, I gotta, you know, I have, I, I'm such a tidier. I'm always putting the things away, right? Before going to bed. There's always like a half hour of things to do before bed, right? Making sure the whole house is put together, that kind of thing. So yes, absolutely. But I, I had, and people were giving me so much flack for working while I was on this vacation. But I'll tell you what, it gave me so much peace of mind. I really do love what I do. But I just can't help it. I got to do it. And I did a lot of self-care in Mexico. Okay. I did all the things that I'm supposed to do in Mexico to be do the self-care. But I there was not one day that I did not work when I was in Mexico. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that is going to be the case because when you're a busy mom and you work full time or even if you're not a mom and you're working a lot, you will have those days where you work a little. But really, you know, the key to true self-care to me is all about reconnecting to yourself, to your nature, to community, so that you feel like you're supported. Because then when your mindset's in the right place and you feel appreciated and loved and supported and the work you're doing as a healer is seen and appreciated, you don't mind if you have to work a few little extra hours. It's it's not such an issue. It, it really boils down to what's happening with your mindset then you make the choices for your body and the mindset also rules what's happening to you emotionally. But I found, you know, when I first started health coaching, I used to try to help people change their food and um, they just fall back into the same old patterns because you really have to deal with that emotion and mindset piece. And this is why I practice is that I teach like meditation and I preach meditation every day day and there's no way I never skip my meditation practice nor do I want to it's like a vacation for me it's like a haven like a massage for my brain but once people really get into meditation they see all these things in perspective so that you know they can maybe go to bed with dirty dishes in the sink I'm laughing because I can never do that but but you know there are times where they're able just to allow missed things on the to-do list or not to do activities that they know are draining or clip away those things that are energy bandits or vampires. That's a big thing that I help people recognize is where in the relationships, where in the, even in the self-care practices, are you doing things that are just time or energy bandits that aren't really giving you a big yield? Mm, I agree. A couple of those things I want to dissect. One of the things that you had mentioned, and this was so similar to the journey that I had been on, I, I became obsessed with nutrition. And my first five books are actually on nutrition. I've written seven to date at this point. Girl, you got a whole lot more books on me. But I was so obsessed. And that's I thought if I could change the way that people ate, I could make a huge impact. But what you like you just said, and at the time when I was discovering this, I was dealing with chronic fatigue and I was sucking down green smoothies like nobody's business. And I realized you cannot green smoothie your way out of chronic stress. Girl, I could run with a smoothie in my hand. I mean, like <laughs> dart out the door. And I kept falling back into these patterns. And it wasn't until I unpeeled the layers that I kept finding myself back here, back here, back on square one. It was like I was driven by these core beliefs, this mindset that I, my worth was driven by my productivity, my, everything. Yeah. My, yeah. my worth was driven by that. That's yeah. poverty consciousness. And I was raised that way too. You know, I grew up in Pittsburgh in a blue collar family and my family was very loving, but they taught me the harder I worked, the better person I was. That was the programming. And my husband had the same thing. So we have to continually remind ourselves that we're still awesome people, even when we don't get all the work done, because that's just the way we were raised. And both of our parents. I mean, my husband grew up in Germany, but he, they came out of a depression. So did my parents. And, you know, that's just, you know, you work hard and be thankful that you have work. And, and, you know, when people give you money, that's, that's how your worth is, is measured. But now that I do all this mindset work and I do work with alchemy and, and yoga, I realize that you do get to a point where you're slave driving yourself and you have to take a step back and you also have to have discernment. And that's what comes when you do these deep meditation practices and healing practices is that it's how do you want to spend your energy with whom in what fashion and what feeds you energetically and then the other piece to that is if you're really suffering from fatigue and I beg you to go and get proper functional medicine testing done to see if you have a gluten sensitivity to see if you have a stealth infection unfortunately traditional MDs don't test for this stuff nor do they understand it and here I had a gluten sensitivity that when I undiagnosed for years because I got the wrong testing. And once I found out and I stopped eating gluten, my energy skyrocketed. And now 
that I'm 46, feeling closer to the way I felt in my 30s. But there was a time in my early 40s where I was borderline type 2 diabetic and I was a healthy weight and nobody could figure out what the heck was going on with me. And I had massive amounts of fatigue and my skin looked terrible and I had a host of things going on. I bet on. brain fog too was just plaguing yeah. me. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, I started writing cookbooks for functional medicine practitioners. And I learned about the microbiome. I learned about potential of having issues with gluten and autoimmune. And, and I got the proper testing done. I also found out I had some crazy things going on for my GI map. I had overgrowth of streptococcus, staphylococcus. And, you know, those bacteria are in your gut normally, but when they're out of control, then you're in trouble. And I had something called campylobacter, which kind of reminds me of salmonella. And that's when I worked in, you know, New York City kitchens. I probably got it there. But, you know, when you get the testing done and if you have really severe fatigue, but you, you got to be honest with yourself. A lot of women don't even want to admit, admit they're tired. No, we, we yeah. live this lie. I used to say that I, my biggest lie was telling myself that I was managing stress because I wasn't crawling on the floor that I was like, I was killing it because I wasn't destroyed. And I think a lot of us feel that way. <laughs> Yeah. And, and we're raised to feel that way. Totally. That's, Everyone that's tells life. you it's normal. Yeah. Every woman I asked, I was like, what's, is this, should I be worried about this? You know, and I was dealing with my chronic fatigue before I really, really knew. I mean, it was, it got to a point where there, there was no denying that that's what was going on with me. But everyone was like, no, that's just how women feel. It's how we oh, operate. I, I was told you're in your forties. This is the name of the game. Just get used to it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is it. This is, this is your plight. This is how we all feel at this age. And the thing is, is I'm afraid that this is how a lot of women do feel at this age as we step into perimenopause and we're not looking at the core root of what's going on. We're not running the functional tests like the Dutch test for our cortisol, our estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, those particular hormones, and looking at those pathways. We're not looking at autoimmunity. We're not looking, we're not doing full thyroid panels. We're not- well, Also, yeah, if you're not looking at, at your genetics. I mean, in my genetics, I see markers that I store estrogen. You know, I don't metabolize estrogen and there's three ways I'm actually storing it, which includes in my muscle tissue, which is very dangerous. And I have a friend who's struggling with stage four estrogen positive breast cancer. And it's scaring the heck out of us. It's horrible. And I think a lot of these things can be remedied if they're caught early and you make the proper lifestyle changes and get the proper help. It is. I have six friends, five or six friends who in the last year were diagnosed with cancer under the age of 50, all women, all endocrine or hormone driven cancers. That's a massive wake up call you know, for the tipping point of what's going on in our bodies, the levels of stressors that we're dealing with toxic wise, perceived stress wise, hidden infection wise. I mean, it's all this, this we're not, and we're not looking at any of those things. Yeah. You know? A lot of people don't realize that, you know, the things that also are endocrine disruptors are in our makeup, in our laundry detergent, in the plastics where you store your food. You know, I had a bout with a basal cell in my nose, which is a very cure, curable form of skin cancer. So I went through and did all that cleansing, but then I met Dr. Tara Scott, who is a functional medicine OBGYN. And she's like, do you know that because of what's going on genetically with your estrogen storage, that I find a lot of those women have basal cell cancer? And I'm like, gosh, that's crazy. And then she said to me, do you have dry eye too? I said, yes. And she says, well, I'm seeing a pattern here. So there are doctors out there who are really amazing, who are just starting to do this kind of very specialized care. But we as women are not getting this traditional care from our regular OBGYNs, which is really sad. And just had my pap smear done. And my doctor, I said to her, I'm in perimenopause. Can you tell me like, what should I do? What kind of food should I eat? She just looked at me like I was a Martian. Yeah, she just, like looked blank at <laughs> you probably blinked her eyes like uh nothing or look into some hormones down the road or maybe yeah, we should like, think we about, talk about hormone therapy yeah. later on i was like <laughs> i want something now it's, i was like what about uh, maca what about maca root? yeah right what about maca what about what about meditation and i want to talk a little bit about a little bit about that you know one of the things and i'm just going to put it out there I was telling you, I'm reading this book by Maya Doonesbury on doing harm, the truth about how bad medicine, lazy science, leave women dismissed, misdiagnosed, and sick. And my concern is that, you know, a lot of us really only have access, not that we couldn't have access to functional doctors, but a lot of us just have access to our typical 
primary care doctors, right? And and one of the ways that I love having this conversation is so often I do feel like people need to be digging deeper and getting the right test. But also just in general, there's so much that we can do. I believe that we have a lot more control than we think. And when we decide to take our health into our own hands and make some of these changes, some of the things that you had mentioned a little bit ago, that that it, it's huge. Like you said, where we put our energy, you know, we don't have to feel overwhelmed all the time. You know, and I find that over being overwhelmed is really setting ourselves up for using our energy for things that don't serve us or maybe don't make us happy, right? We are so dutiful. I find I was very dutiful. I said yes to everything, Jennifer, and things I absolutely did not want to do, but I thought it was the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I that's what I was referring to when I was talking about energy vampires and also about just taking a hardcore look at your relationships. And if you have these frenemies and, you know, these kind of people around you to, to think about trimming the fat. And, you know, this is something I've done in the last couple of years when I've been going through a lot of my healing work with, you know, my face and my gut and the work I'm doing um, with Dr. Scott is, you know, where can I trim? And also just know that it's totally fine to say, you know, I cannot do this benefit. People come to me all the time wanting pro bono work. But what's really interesting is the more you're selective about where you want to give and the more you say politely, I can't because I have other obligations, the less the energy vampires come. And the more you're able to give from a different space and the more that you give to people that will give back to you. So being more selective about your energy and being less about duty and more about where it feels energetically good to say yes or give or help. That's where the true magic is because those opportunities will energize you versus the I have to, I must to be a good daughter, be a good wife, be a good Whatever. Whatever. Yeah. Employee, community person, whatever, whatever you signed up for. And I'm all about community and I still do pro bono things. I usually don't publicize my pro bono things though. You know, I do them when I, when I feel the urge to give some to someone. But I remember one year I was actually doing 15 pro bono events and I felt like a shell of myself after that because I work 70 hours a week. I have a health coaching practice. I do three books a year and I came to realize that I, you know, it just got to a point where you feel like you're you're so just drained beyond re- relief but when you do the kind of practice where you have more mindset around what you're doing and the way you can tell basically whether or not you should do something pro bono or even take a job as a paid job is how do you feel the same thing when you're taking on a patient as a practitioner you know, if you have bad energy from a patient from the get-go, it's probably not a patient you want to take on if you can afford to do it financially. You know, we've all had those patients that don't comply, that are negative, that just won't be helped. And it's the same thing when you're in your social life and when you're meeting new friends, if you're getting a gut reaction from someone or somebody says something that right away you're like, ooh, like, you know, that was harsh or I don't know about this person. I, you know, I just so encourage women out there because we're trained and taught and it's also our nature just to be giving and lovely to go ahead and be like, and that doesn't feel good to me. And you can be very graceful about how you say no. You can be kind, but please start saying no. <laughs> please. And start doing the stuff you want to do. Absolutely. Well, one of the things I always advocate for women to do, and it can just transcend into what you love to do in terms of what fuels you for work or what fuels you for your time. But I have women create a joy list. And and because so often we don't even know what we love. We don't know the things that bring us joy. We've never taken the time to write those things down. And I find that so much of our joy list is very much our self-care list. You know, going on a hike, having a mini dance party, buying a, a matcha latte, buying flowers at Trader Joe's or wherever you get them and 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 taking the time to arrange those things, You're reading a good book, you know, over the weekend, whatever, whatever that is, like, and then committing to doing three of those things every single week. And part of that joy list is the free things and then the things that cost a little bit of money because the things that bring you joy don't have to necessarily cost you money. But I feel like you can transcend send that into asking yourself this question. Now, I have a good friend of mine who, before she commits to any new project or any new thing, she takes about 48 hours, meditates on it, thinks on it before she gives a, a, an answer to it, 
whether it is aligned with what she wants and if it's aligned with her soul's calling. And I remember looking at her when she told me this like five years ago, and I just looked at her like she was crazy initially because I was like, wait, what? Like you can, do you get to do that? I just felt like that was such, I don't know. It just didn't feel like I never had thought to do that. I always just said, yes. I was always so reactive, even in my decisions about my life and my business. And I just made quick decisions about it. And I was like, wow, that just feels like such a luxury to just sit back for 48 hours and think about whether you're going to do it or not. But oh my goodness, the, it, it's the game change. You get yeah, so it's, much it's clarity. Compa- it's, it's compassion for self. And it, it's interesting in my study of alchemy, alchemy actually, when you first start studying it, you learn that soul and spirit are different. So the idea of soul is, is attached to emotions and sensuality and sex and self-care and spirits attached to mindset and what you're doing for the community and what your spiritual purpose is. And when you separate them out like that, you realize that you have have to make sure that you're taking care of both those pieces. Now, what's great for practitioners like yourself, your business is your spiritual practice. You've got that tapped down, but you got to take care of the soulful. But being able to sit back and kind of really ruminate on the mindset portion too can set you up later for having more time for your soulful practice and more time for your body. Because we have to work those three pieces all the time and we have to make sure we're taking care of those three areas. And when people talk about holistic practice, people are usually skewed in one area too much. They're either too much on the sensuality or they're too much on the food, which they can become orthorexic, or they're too much on the mindset and they're starving the body. So, you know, the holistic practice has means really that those three pieces are given the proper amount of attention so that you're balanced. And that's what those trinities always are in all the spiritual traditions, that idea that you're taking care of the body, the emotions, and the mindset. Mm, I love that. Talk to me a little bit about your transformation around meditation and how that became something that really locked in for you. Just because I'd love to hear your story around that. And then also I'd love to hear a little bit about, you talked about being in perimenopause. We know that that transition can feel so much like limbo. A lot of doctors have misconceptions about what that is. And speak to me about not, I mean, separate from healing your body and getting to the root cause of what's going on, but how have you integrated some of these self-care practices in for your own life? It sounds like it's happened a lot in your, in these last several years for you. Yeah. I mean, mindset and meditation has just been a huge part of my healing and also just me being very successful in my, in my career, especially in when I was a chef. And, you know, I started out in a place that wasn't so great. My entire family suffers from obesity and many members have been morbidly obese and have died from complications related to that, including heart issues and alcoholism and other issues. And, you know, I was well on my way to being one of those people. And, you know, I had a fierce eating addiction in my 20s. And I was like the Snickers and Pepsi girl, you know, every day hitting the sugar hard. Oh, girl, yeah. Diet Pepsi and peppermint patties for me. (laughs) I feel like we all have our trigger foods. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, in my late 20s, you know, I started to clean up my diet and I saw a big transformation. But then I found yoga. And through yoga, I came to realize that this emotional eating addiction had to go. And I was tensing my stomach every time I went to to eat when I wasn't hungry. And I saw that there was this mind-body connection. So I would just relax my body and take a breath. And sometimes I would still eat the Snickers bar, but most times I wouldn't. And I did this for about a year and the emotional eating addiction went away. And then after that, I conquered my next fear, which was my dream of becoming a chef. And I went to culinary school in 2003. I start working in kitchens with dudes. It was rough. And then after that experience, I worked in kitchens for about three years. I fell into some amazing private chef jobs with some killer celebrities. And there were all kinds of Sarah Jessica Parker was coming to the one place where I was cooking. There's all sorts of madness going on. And I was able to keep my head on straight because of my strong yoga and meditation practice. And all these synchronistic things start happening to me. And I kept saying, to myself, my gosh, why me? I'm just a small town girl from Pittsburgh. I don't have the talent. I'm just a nobody. And these, you know, my first time on the t- on on TV was the Today Show. Like, 
miraculous things were happening. But what I started to understand is once I could get over my fears through meditation, I could show my love for food and healing. And that's what attracted people to me was that passion for food and, you know, that, that excitement around food and healing. And that's why the opportunities were coming. And then I would say maybe in my late thirties, I started to slow down physically and I saw a lot of changes. And that's when I had to go deeper into some healing practices. And I started to work in functional medicine and get some testing done. And then I started thinking about what's going on with my hormones. And now I'm in perimenopause. And I can tell you, it's a different ball game. Since I've had some healing with my gut and some other things through the functional medicine testing and coaching, my energy is very good. I would say similar to when I'm in my 30s. However, my lifestyle has had to do some serious changing. There's no more staying out late. There's no more drinking every night. I used to have two glasses of wine every night. I had to say bye-bye to that. So there will be things that you have to adjust as you go through uh, perimenopause. It doesn't mean you have to say goodbye to good, strong energy throughout the day, but you do have to respect the body as you mature as your progesterone starts to go down, as your estrogen levels start to change. And this is when people talk about aging gracefully. This doesn't just happen. The women that age gracefully are doing things behind the scenes that they're not sharing, which probably is some of the things I'm doing, like getting to bed by 930, reading a book, meditating every day, really curbing how much alcohol I'm having, getting rid of the issue that I've had with gluten, doing a lot of these things, completely avoiding junk food. I used to indulge in candy a little bit more. Now I've just, you know, maybe it's one or two pieces of dark chocolate a week. So these aren't really major shifts, but I think when I was in my 30s and I could sleep six hours and be fine, and now I have to sleep eight hours, I'm willing to put the time in to get to bed earlier to organize my schedule so that I can make sure I still have that killer A-type energy throughout the day. And, you know, I'm kickboxing three times a week. I'm level two and I kickbox with the professional MMA fighter and I keep up with him. God bless my soul. And I'm doing yoga three days a week. I'm traveling around the world. I'm working like a maniac and I'm doing all the things I did in my thirties, but I'm really respecting what drains my energy, what does not. And I'm understanding that the body will slow down to a degree, but if you treat it in the correct way, you can still have good energy throughout the day. And that's what's important. I agree. I think one of the things that you mentioned was, you know, just aging gracefully. You know, I just talk about going through these transitions with ease and grace, but also our res our resilience. You know, we really shouldn't have gotten away with drinking two glasses of wine for so long to begin with, right? We're now just feeling the the repercussions of that. And at some point, you know, you can you can run full blast. You can blast through life and you can get away with that for a while, but then eventually it does keep catch up with you because it is stress on the system. Ultimately, we're going to begin to feel that. I think that when we start to feel some of these signs, maybe in our, even in our early thirties or in our mid thirties, whenever that time is, it's really an opportunity to kind of reassess how we're taking care of our bodies. Our bodies deserve to be taken care of. And I believe that we can be all the things we want to be and still take care of our bodies all the time. You're right. I used to drink a lot more. I don't drink very much anymore. One with my Hajimoto's diagnosis. And just overall, it, I just don't feel great. I know my liver is just like, what is going on? And drinking can be one of those energy vampires that we talk about. Wow. And, you know, I live outside of New York in Hoboken, which is a party town, and I get invited out to a lot of venues. And, you know, my friends used to razz me about it. They'd be like, oh, what, you're not drinking, you know, and they would try to peer pressure me. And I would say, no, because it drains me. I have a busy day tomorrow and I want to feel my best. But what, you know, standard medical practices don't tell you, they say, oh, a glass of wine a day is fine. That can actually disrupt your sleep patterns. So if you are having one or two glasses and you're in your 30s and you feel kind of okay, but you're waking up in the middle of the night and you're not able to fall asleep, that's impl impacting your insulin. So this, these are the kind of practices that you need to sort of tailor and you need to do it based on your own body. Everybody has different tolerances and you, know, you may have something like a sulfite allergy or you just may not be able to process it. You may have something going on with your liver. You don't even know, but it's basically you you can gauge how do you feel after you do the practice? How do you feel when you scale back? And my girlfriends in their 30s, they say, if I don't drink, I feel like a superwoman. And I'm like, there you go. And I still have wine to this day. I love it. I don't want to I love give wine too. Oh my gosh, especially Italian it's wine. It's about limiting it. 
Absolutely. Well, and a lot of the wine made in the U.S., oh my gosh, so many pesticides, herbicides, and endocrine disruptors. No wonder we feel like crap when we drink some of that. So be really mindful about the type of wine you're drinking, but also we can transmit that over to food, right? You know, like I'll go out to dinner with friends and I'm totally the unpopular kid there, but I'm like, listen, I have a really amazing day tomorrow. I got interviews. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And I... I want to feel great tomorrow. And I know that if I make these choices tonight, it's going to determine how I feel the next day. And it's just not worth it to me. And that's the real, that's the real question you got to ask yourself. You know, is it worth it? Is it worth it to feel like crap the next day? And most of the time, it's never worth it. It just is another, yeah. And another thing is if you're doing your proper self-care and you're getting rid of those energy vampires and you're meditating, you'll be strong enough to say to your group, like whoever's kind of teasing you, where you're like, oh, well, maybe it's okay to to dig into this ice cream sundae or or whatever it is, that you'll be strong enough to say like, no, I really like that feeling of being super rested and feeling good the next day. And you'll be able to have a little bit of distance before you sort of go for that, that habit. And, you know, we've all been there. And, and, Lord knows, like, you know, in the beginning, I let my friends, because a lot of my friends don't feel horrible when they have two glasses of wine, or they do feel horrible, but they're not saying. They're not saying <laughs> I it. I think that's probably the case. <laughs> yeah. They're, yeah, they're definitely not saying it yet, right? That's so funny. It's so true. And it's just, I mean, I think it's just about asking yourself those questions. I think that's the, the underlying current of a lot of what this conversation is about, is just getting clarity on where you want to put your energy and how you want to feel. You know, we're heading to a wedding this weekend where actually my husband and I are both in the wedding. And I'm really mindful going into this wedding experience about making good food choices because it's a three-day event and those events can really avalanche. I'm already being very mindful about how I want to treat those next three days because on the back end of those three days, I've got two big speaking engagements. And so I want to be really ready. I know that if I don't do the weekend right, it can really have some pretty serious repercussions on me during the week, the next week. And I think when we start to look at that and assess that, then we can start making conscious decisions about how we want to feel and then base our behaviors on that. Absolutely. And, and food and, you know, can have a big impact on how you feel emotionally. People don't realize that, you know, if you're, you're not eating well and you're overdoing it, that this can create brain fog and anxiety and, you know, really mess with your sleep patterns and all the things that you don't need when you have to get up and give a big presentation or you're on a huge project or, you know, you want to show that you're doing your best work. And, you know, that's what you have to consider when you start to to let go of some of these habits that really aren't supporting you. Exactly. You know, I think so much of it is, I have a good friend of mine who was talking to me about boundaries, self-care boundaries. And one of her self-care boundaries is a boundary that I don't practice personally, but she said, you know, she travels a lot. She's on planes a lot. She said, I, one of my self-care boundaries is that I don't book a flight before 10 a.m. And I was like, what? That is, um," and I was like, go girl, do you? Like, I loved it. And she's like, that just me, if I have to come in a day earlier or whatever, that's just one of those things I'm not willing to compromise. Really what it was in that moment, it was a next level of permission to just say, you know what, this is just not what I'm going to do. It's just not as a horrible, horrible morning person, like an absolute bear. I can totally feel her. And my, my husband like had us get up at six o'clock this morning to get this late to come to Toronto. And, and, you know, I've been slow all day and that's okay because I don't have anything going on tomorrow. We're going to sleep in. But to me, sleep is the holy grail of feeling great. If I sleep, and I remember talking to Dr. Tara Scott, my OBGYN, I was like, I actually admitted to her that I sleep between eight and nine hours a night and I was embarrassed about it. And she's like, no, that's amazing. Oh my God. She's like, you're lucky. Keep doing it. But I was embarrassed. I'm embarrassed telling you because I was raised that that's too much sleep and that's lazy. It's lazy, and, right? Yeah. yeah. Do I feel amazing? Yes. I feel amazing when I sleep that much. Amazing. I also have a confession and I do not feel guilty about it. I absolutely need eight to nine hours of sleep. You know, I got seven and a half yesterday. It was because I was reading a really good book and I couldn't put it down. We're night owls here. You know, I don't mind putting it out there. We got, I went to bed around one o'clock this morning, which is late. Normally it's usually midnight, but I didn't get up until 830. 
And we don't normally get up until 8 or 8.30. Beautiful thing about me being an entrepreneur is I don't have to. And we don't have kids yet. So we don't, we're not, we're not subject, subjected to that either. But my husband and I, we do best with eight to nine hours of sleep. And honestly, I'm so high functioning during the day. I deserve it. Yeah. That's how and I, I feel. Also, you know, when I get that kind of sleep, I don't have that three o'clock lag. And I, I'm so productive during the day. I'm focused the whole day. I can, you know, in my normal work day, I usually get up by 7.38. Of course, my lovely husband has the coffee going. And I love that reishi mushroom coffee. I drink that too. And I'm up by 8. I'm working on my computer. And I can work to, to 6, 7, or 8 o'clock and be totally fine. I take an hour break. You know, Monday, Wednesday, or Monday, Thursday, I go and I take a two hour break because I kickbox and then I give myself a break to read. But I can work eight to eight when I get the proper sleep. And I love my work. So my work doesn't feel like burdensome. It's interesting and intriguing. And I think in that way, we're very lucky. But I think, I think sleep is just so, you know, greatly underrated. And I, it just, it's such a luxury to get a good night's sleep. So I have two things to say. One, girl, you deserve all that sleep. From this point forward, you don't feel guilty at all, (laughs) ever about it. You are doing so much in the world. You are creating so much phenomenal content for for us to benefit from. And if that's because you are getting the sleep that you need, then amen, you get to have it. Never feel guilty about it again. And number two, sleep isn't just a luxury. It is a necessity. It is a core necessity. The reason why we are struggling so much with chronic fatigue and brain fog, you know, I surveyed 10,000 women before, a couple months before my book came out, and I wanted to know what were the three, the three biggest things that were rocking their world every single day. Number one or number two was brain fog. And brain fog, because they knew they weren't getting enough sleep and they felt like zombies getting through their day. They felt so non-productive by three o'clock in the afternoon because they had nothing left. Um, Number two was weight resistance. They were struggling with weight and cravings. And then the third one connected to the brain fog was just the overall fatigue. And to me, they were one and the same. And so much of it, they knew they attributed it to the lack of sleep that they were getting because they felt like they just didn't have that luxury. And, you know, it was one of the biggest areas I've been focusing my efforts on is helping women create an evening routine that really shuts the brain off, shuts off that mental chatter because you can't Tasmanian devil your way into bed every night. You just can't. Girl, I tried. <laughs> I tried for years. <laughs> Did you kick? I would have kicked box my way into the bed. <laughs> kick box, Tasmanian devil, you know, all the ways. And so it's just one of those non-negotiables for me. You know, talking about my friend with her, I don't book a flight till 10 a.m. My non-negotiable even if we book an early flight, I have to at minimum get seven hours because I I have to, I've told myself, I've programmed myself that I will not be the high functioning being I need to be if I don't get that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, cravings and, and weight gain has also been shown that that's not getting enough sleep. I mean, that rolls because your body's trying to reach out and, and get some kind of energy from anywhere because you didn't get the rest that it needed. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness. I could even, woo, get a whole other topic. So tell me, Jennifer, honey, this is book number 23. Is that correct? I, you know, I've lost track. It's either 23 <laughs> or 24. <laughs> okay. It's my favorite one. It's my favorite though, because I do a lot of ghost writing. So this book I feel is really the culmination of, of everything I've done to date. You know, all my work with my meditation, with my yoga practice, learning about alchemy and working with integrated and functional medicine practitioners. And I name it Superfood Alchemy because it's really about alchemizing your self-care practice. So one of the things I learned in alchemy when I started studying it five years ago was that when you combine things in a particular way, one plus one can equal four or a thousand. And as an A-type woman, I was like, man, this is awesome. So let me give you an example of how that works in the real world. So we all know that turmeric is good for us, but turmeric actually isn't that bioavailable. So it's very hard for our body to keep it in our digestion or, or take it up into our body. So one of the ways to make it a little bit more absorbable, while well, a lot more absorbable, is by adding black pepper. And then there's a lot of studies around adding fat and heat to it. So when I use turmeric in the book, I'm keeping this in mind and I'm alchemizing the recipes. But what I found when it comes to self-care, if you have one area that you're really working with, you have to make sure that you're taking care of the physical part of that area. So the book is really broken down into the seven 
gland systems or the seven chakras. So you deal with the physical aspects and I teach you how to do that through superfoods that are highly nutrient dense and adaptogenic foods, which help your body reach adapt or reach home. Basis. So if you're working with the brain, I use reishi mushroom, but then I also use things like nuts and seeds that are high in magnesium and then also fat sources, healthy fat sources. So I'm really combining that, you know, that science and spiritual practice together. But as you leaf through the book, once you take care of the physical, maybe you make yourself, you know, a delicious reishi mushroom coffee with a nice fat source in there and, you know, you follow the recipe in the book, you sit down to meditate and, you know, the meditations are also especially created for each area of the body. And then I talk about sensual practice. So I have DIY essential oil beauty for each section. So that as your own alchemist, you can start to see the correspondence or the correlations between these three areas. So for example, you know, if you've got something going on with a heart, is it just the heart, the organ, or do you have heartbreak that you haven't healed? Or is it that you feel that you haven't really shared your greatest purpose with the world and you're in a job that sucks? You know, you have to look at all these pieces because true healing, because we're complex beings, it has to happen on the body, the soul, or the emotional level, and in the mind. So when it comes to true healing, you have to make sure that you're healing in each one of those areas. And what I suggest to people is start where it hurts the most and work in that chapter. So healing also isn't linear. You may jump around to the chapters or you may want to cherry pick from certain ones. If you're having brain fog, you're going to want to go to the brain chapter and you're going to learn. You're going to learn a lot about science, but I also sprinkle in the magic of woo, the crystals and the meditation and the other things that can kind of give you that magical experience that I think people are longing for too. But ancient alchemists were really mixing right brain and left brain practices. So those were the people that created the pyramids. They had these amazing visions and then they backed it up with mathematics to make it happen. So this is what happens, you know, when you're working with these uber heal is that they're looking at all these different pieces and how you can coordinate them. But in the book, I show you how to do that. I take the guesswork out. And the book is all plant-based. I do in the beginning explain if you want to do meat sources. And, you know, I'm, I eat more paleo. I'm an omnivore except for gluten. But I really go through and explain that to you. And no one eating pattern is right for any one person, but we do know that vegetables are where the Yeah, are. let's be honest. Plants are the bomb diggity. Like, Eat your plants. That's it. And that's your adaptogenic foods. There's not an adaptogenic meat or dairy. <laughs> it's plants. It's ultimately yeah. what it comes down it's, to. And that's why I kept the book vegan because I wanted it to be a healing book. And if you want to take the recipes and sprinkle a little grass-fed something on it or a pasture-raised egg, I explain in the beginning of the book how to do that. But it's all about plants and the recipes are delicious. First of all, because I'm a chef, they have to be. Second, because they have to hit that soulful, sensual aspect to feel good to you as you're eating them. So the idea is if you can make plants soulful, you can source them in a way that makes sense for your mindset, for the planet, and they feed your body, then you've got all three pieces. You're alchemizing your meals. And that's really what the book is about. I love it. I love, well, I love the idea of alchemy. I'm very plant-based. We're essential oil people as well. I'm not, you know, my book was the essential oils hormone solution. And I love the idea of alchemy and how we can interplay a lot of adaptogenic plants to work together to create that self-care. I think this is just absolutely wonderful. Now, where do we get this book? I know it came out, you said today. It came out today. Yeah. So yeah, today is the pub date. Congratulations. So, oh my gosh, thank you so much. I'm such a proud mommy. So my husband, who also works in integrated and functional medicine, has built me a gorgeous website. It's superfoodalchemy.com. And I've got a free video series on there. So even if you don't get the book, you can get the video series. In the video series, I, I start to teach you how to be your own alchemist. And you learn everything from basics of plant-based eating to meditation, crystals, and even how to sage your space. But you can also find where to pr purchase the book on the website and see some of the photos inside so you get a little taste of the book before you buy it. I love it. And tell me the website. We're going to have it in the show notes, by the way, everyone. So don't the worry. title of the book, superfoodalchemy.com. Wonderful. Superfoodalchemy.com. Is there anything else, any last little thing you want to share with us before we, we finish up? I'm so, so grateful for the amazing healers who are operating in this world. And I want people who are listening to this to just know if there's something you need to heal or you need to feel better emotionally, it's totally incomplete 
completely possible. You can do it yourself. You can work with one of these amazing practitioners. You can buy one of these books and you can start the healing process today that all these wonderful things are available to you and you deserve them. Just like my eight to nine hours of sleep a night. Exactly. You have freed me from the bonds of feeling guilty about sleep. You are never going to feel sleep. guilty about that again. You're going to wear that like a badge of honor, like a superwoman. Eight to nine hours, baby. That's what I'm doing over We're here. Start a new club instead of the Joy Luck Club. It's going to be the eight, eight to nine, nine hour hours sleep club. club. I love it. But yes, I'm just, I'm so truly honored to have a chance to work with these amazing healers. And we have to be grateful that we have people like this operating in the world. I agree. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer, for coming on and sharing your brilliance, sharing your brilliance through your journey, right? Our journeys, you know what, they're not necessarily unique, but what matters there is that, you know, through what we've learned, through taking care of ourselves, we've been able to go and disseminate that out. So I just want to say thank you so much for using your journey as an opportunity to go out and shed light for so many amazing nurturers out there who really, it's their time to take care of themselves as well. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely, honey. See you soon. Wow, how refreshing was that? Jennifer's philosophy is something that I can absolutely 100% get behind in a big way, probably because her philosophy is so much like mine. And did you know that her amazing self-care video series even includes essential oils? She is clearly a girl after my own heart. I mean, we are definitely on the same wavelength. What I loved about Jennifer's philosophy was not only the beauty of nourishing foods and looking at self-care in a different way, but also how we can leverage this into our emotional and spiritual well-being, which I think is so important. Now, in this new book and self-care series that she's created, she's able to incorporate all of these pieces. If you are open to checking out her 10-part self-care series, I'm going to have the link in the show notes. It is going to be episode 87 that you're going to get this. It'll also be in the show notes where the podcast is found. And you can get her book. It's called Superfood Alchemy, which by the way, the book is gorgeous. The recipes, oh my goodness, are just so in alignment with all of my favorite foods. The pictures are beautiful. It's just You know, every now and again, you get a cookbook and you're just like, whoa, this is just creatively beautiful and genius. And that's exactly what it is. You can see so much of our heart and soul was poured into this. So go and grab the book, Superfood Alchemy. It's available everywhere books are sold, definitely on Amazon. You can order it from her site as well, which is superfoodalchemy.com slash book. Well, thank you so much for stopping by and listening into the Essentially You podcast. In the next episode that we are bringing on, which I am so, so, so excited about, is going to be an episode by yours truly. So I am coming back with a vengeance. I'm going to be talking about my Hajimoto's diagnosis and what I did to get well. So if you know somebody who is dealing with an autoimmune condition, but specifically related to your thyroid, have them cue in. Let them know about this upcoming episode you yourself, there's going to be so much great information just overall and understanding the gut, understanding the immune system and understanding how to eat and take care of yourself so that you avoid the possibility of something like Hajimoto's or some type of autoimmune condition. So this is going to be where it's at. Actually, the next two episodes that are coming up are going to be about autoimmunity because this is an area that I get hundreds of messages about since I have broke the story about my own Hajimoto's diagnosis. And so I'm really excited to shed some light on this. So these next two episodes, not only am I going to be sharing my story, but I have a special guest, Palmer Kippola, who was able to reverse her multiple sclerosis. And she has a new book out called Beat Autoimmune. It just, just came out. So I'm super excited to have her on the episode after mine. So that's going to be happening on May 7th and then May 10th, back to back. So be looking out for those. And thank you so much for coming on. I look forward to seeing you at the next episode. Until then, have an amazing week. Bye.